Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very pleased to welcome you all to our conference on IFRS standards and regulation. This conference brings together a wide range of financial reporting experts and stakeholders and representatives of the enforcement community. They will bring their different perspectives to discuss the interaction between financial reporting, notably IFRS standards and enforcement. Before greeting the speakers and panelists, I would express our appreciation for the impressive range of participants registered for the conference. It is great to see that so many are interested in this topic. This will make also our conference a great opportunity for networking. Let me first say a few words about EFRAC, also I believe that many of you, if not all, are already familiar with EFRAC and our activities. EFRAC's mission is to serve the European public interest by developing and promoting European views in the field of financial reporting, EFRAC works to ensure that the European views are properly considered in the ISB standard setting process and in related international debates. EFRAC has now four streams of activities. Firstly, our research work in which we try to provide thought leadership designed to encourage international debate. Many thanks. <laughs> Many thanks. <laughs> ESMA is, is uh, useful. <laughs> Dear Seven, that was previous. EFRAC <laughs> influence the ISB. Secondly, EFRAC provides the European views in the ISB standard setting process, starting from early stage through the post-implementation review. This to ensure that the resulting standards are fit for Europe. Then, when the ISB has issued the final or revised standard or interpretation, EFRAC's third activity is to advise the European Commission on whether this meets the criteria for endorsement for use in Europe. This includes whether endorsement will be conducive to the European public good. Our fourth stream of activities has started with the European Lab that was created last year. The European Lab hopes to publish soon its first report on climate-related reporting, obviously financial reporting cannot be seen in isolation from the wider corporate reporting. EFRAC's legitimacy is built on transparency, governance, due process, including field tests, impact analysis, and outreach events, public accountability, and truth leadership. I am calling on all of you with an interest in financial reporting to contribute to EFRAC's due process and give us your input as part of our public consultations and outreaches. Coming back to today's conference, we are delighted to have two outstanding speakers providing the keynote speech. Michel Prada, former IFRS Foundation trustee chairman, and Stephen Mayer, chair of ESMA will address you and provide the context for the discussion of today. Merci, Stephen. Merci, Michel, de votre présence ici. We will have two panel discussions. The first will address the question, should IFRS be more rule-based to support enforcement? The context for this table was then by Pervenche Vérez, who was a well-respected colleague in Parliament. Bonjour, Pervenche. The panel will be moderated by Alain Deckers of the European Commission. The second panel will discuss whether regulators should issue implementation rules for principles based IFRS. Chiara Del Prete, EFRA Tech Chairwoman, new chairwoman for tech, since April 
will set the scene for the panel discussion. This panel will be moderated by Stig Inevelsen. To my regret, Stig had decided to retire from the EFRAG board. I want to take this opportunity to thank him for all his contributions in various functions at EFRAG since the beginning. He has brought impressive added value, a great thank you to Stick. Not only Stick is going to retire from EFRAC, also EFRAC's technical director, Patricia McBride, is retiring from EFRAC. Tomorrow is her last day, day of EFRAC, at EFRAC. During almost six years, I supported EFRAC's technical activity. We, would, we could benefit from the air knowledge, expertise, and long experience. I thank Patricia for her commitment to EFRAG and wish her a bright future in Scotland. <laughs> However, it is not yet time to say goodbye to Patricia. Today, Patricia will be our master of ceremony. I am pleased to hand over to Patricia. I wish you a fruitful discussion this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean-Paul, and thank you for setting the tone of the conference as collaborative, friendly, and a sense of humor. Just before I introduce our first keynote speaker, we're going to make you do your housework. You should have a piece of paper like that on your chair. Where, if you haven't managed to do so already, can you please log into the um, Wi-Fi here? And if you're as blind as I am, not only is it welcome TE2019, but there's an exclamation mark at the end. Hopefully, most of you are sufficiently competent to have done that already. Then we're going to move on to Slido, and so we're using Slido for a number of questions during the panel sessions but we need to get you connected now because that's going to be your main mechanism for asking questions of our speakers. So please log on. You can download Slido if it isn't already one of the automatic things on your phone at slido.com. And surprisingly, the password is FRAG, which I think you can probably all spell no exclamation mark. So most of you seem to be under control. We're going to test this, and can we have the first Slido question, please? If the technology is working for us. <coughs> Wonderful. I realize we should have had an all of the above because there are so many of us in the room that do a bit of everything. <coughs> Looks as though we've got a materiality problem with other because it's <laughs> Okay, have most people finished struggling? Or oh, I can I can see a number of fingers still working. We've got 41 so far, which means at least half of you in the room are technically competent. <laughs> Oh, the regulators are coming up. Are you connected now, Stephen? Okay, 
I think we're pretty much right there. Now, while you've got your phone in your hand, can you turn it onto silent so that we can hear the speakers? Having done the admin work, um, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker. I think everybody's heard of Michel Prada and just about everybody's met him. His career has worked through regulation into standard setting, so we couldn't have anyone better to set the tone for the conference with his final position being as the chairman of trustees at the IFRS Foundation and just about everything on the way through. Michel. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a pleasure and an honor to participate in this conference, and I'm grateful to EFRAC Board President Jean-Paul Gauzet for inviting an old-timer to deliver a speech as an introduction to this meeting and to have an opportunity to catch up with a number of old friends. <clears throat> when I asked Jean-Paul what he was expecting from me, he answered, you just say whatever you wish. This was a risky proposal, offering carte blanche to a veteran who has no more institutional responsibilities, nor external control, only some sense of self-control. Having thought about the history of IFRS, during which I was an actor, among others, for many years, and which I have now witnessed from the outside for exactly one year after having handed over to Erky Lee Cannon, I first decided to revisit some of the debates that took place when I was involved and that are still occasionally reopened. And I then thought it would be appropriate to address some of the new issues the IFRS Foundation and the IASB are facing. <clears throat> the EU has been a leading player in the history of IFRS being the first major economy to implement them, an active participant in the conception of the standards and also a leading player in the oversight of the foundation. At the same time, Europe has also been the most vocal of critics, which in some situations created tension that had no equivalent in the world. I guess there was some French influence in this uh, this is a behavior that is quite familiar to my compatriots. Focusing on the positives, Europe uh, really does deserve a great deal of credit for encouraging most of the rest of the world to follow suit. If we take stock of the ongoing progress in large Asian economies, it is only the US which continues to go their own way, and not a very different one, by the way, for reasons we well know. When focusing on the core debates, I identify three main topics on which I have some views that I would like to share with you. The first one is a bit controversial here. It is the concept of a European interest with regard to IFRS. And I have to confess that I have never understood what that meant when speaking about accounting standards. As a convinced European citizen, I see a number of domains where there is an obvious and strategic need to defend and promote the European interest. And I'm often disappointed by our slow progress and our collective lack of ambition to deal with these issues. I therefore hope sincerely that our new parliament and commission will deliver but do we seriously believe that there is a European way of dealing with amortization, revenue recognition, or leasing? Of course, there are lively technical debates on these issues and possibly different solutions to address them, but these are conceptual and akin to physics or chemistry, not linked to national or regional considerations. Unfortunately, I have the feeling that this debate is behind us, as most market players have clearly opted against an EU version of IFRS, and rightly so. The second debate is in relation to financial stability. 
This one is obviously more complex. As a matter of principle, I tend to consider that accounting has little to do with financial stability, which mainly depends on the good functioning of markets and the relevance of macroprudential and political management. Accounting is there to describe economic reality. It does not trigger this reality per se. Although, we know that the mere description of a phenomenon has obvious consequences on the behavior of stakeholders who observe it and react to it. The choice is thus fairly simple. Is it better to hide the truth or to face it? The answer is pretty clear to me as transparency is of the essence of efficient market. Having said that, I recognize that the solution is less obvious than for the first debate I mentioned. Being an art as well as a science, accounting may take stock of some aspects of financial stability issues, if only because of the principle of prudence, which is one of the core principles of the accounting conceptual framework. Three good examples are the good compromise on the use of historic cost versus fair value, the evolution of the standard for provisioning, and the ongoing discussion on goodwill. The last debate relates to accounting and long-term strategies. Here again, I tend to believe that those who blame accounting standards for encouraging short-termism are misguided. The truth is that a long-term strategy requires relevant funding arrangements, which those who have to decide are sometimes unable or possibly unwilling to implement, namely a significant proportion of equity and a debt that is structured along the profile of positive and plausible cash flows. The history of Eurotunnel is there to remind us of this relatively mundane principle. But here again, accounting standards may take in consideration long-term issues, as shown when the Financial Crisis Advisory Group formed to advise the IASB and the FASB on their responses to the crisis advocated in favor of a differentiation between instruments held to maturity and those available for sale. On the whole, though, I have the feeling that these heated debates are mostly behind us. Allow me, therefore, to address the future. Besides the undebatable task of maintenance and implementation of the standards for financial reporting, where a lot remains to be done, notably with regard to the consideration given to non-GAAP measures, we witness today a questioning of the IFRS Foundation regarding Firstly, the consequences of digitization, which I shall not address because of my incompetence in this domain. And secondly, its possible role in relation to new reporting requirements linked to ESG requirements and more globally, non-financial reporting. Indeed, those who would like the IFRS Foundation to get involved in this domain pay tribute to the professionalism and efficiency of the IASB. But is their view justified? Together with Hans Uggevors, the talented chairman of the IASB, I do share the view that the fundamental evolution of politics in this direction of sustainable development is welcome, and that progress by corporates and financial institutions in this direction should be a priority for the years to come. First of all, and having been convinced by the recent and remarkable Patrick de Cambour report on this issue, I do believe that there is an urgent need for objectivity and legitimacy of the concepts and standard setting in these new domains if we wish to avoid the risks of hypocrisy, political correctness, greenwashing, and other misrepresentations of the performance of corporates and financial instruments. But can accountants play a leading role in this evolution? I have mixed views on this and see basically 
three different situations. The first one is the most obvious and simple, but also the most tricky. There is a need for an appropriate regulation and pricing of the negative externalities that derive from our collective wrong behaviors, either by taxation or by markets. Some 10 years ago, I chaired a committee in France on the organization of carbon markets. Where are we today? Quite disappointing, isn't it? Anyway, if we were bold enough to do it, accountants could step in and design the relevant standards. Uh, it is their job to measure costs and benefits. Wherever there is a possibility for financial measurement, there is no doubt accounting standard setters should take the lead. And by the way, I understand that they try to do it, for example, in dealing with the accounting standards for emission trading schemes. A second situation is when there is no clear pricing, but there exists some possibilities to try and identify the consequences of ESG strategies and obligations on the situation and performance of firms. Maybe then there is a way for accounting standard setters to play a role, and I understand that this is precisely what the ISB is considering when looking at the possible enrichment of the so-called management commentary. The third situation would see the IFRS foundation into some kind of supermarket for standard setting, dealing with all sorts of non-financial reporting matters. And this is particularly obvious uh, when dealing with social issues, consumer protection, corporate governance, and the like. These do require specific standards and reporting, but I don't think it is a task for accountants. Contrary to the situation regarding accounting standards, I see a true European interest in taking the lead regarding ESG standard setting and reporting. This is a necessary task if we want to avoid wishful thinking and unfair competition within EU markets, between firms, and between products. From this point of view, the present situation regarding the description of financial instruments offered to the public with regard to their green, sustainable, or ethical characteristics is not fully satisfactory, as underlined on the occasion of recent AMF Entretien in Paris and by Svein Giegold in his remarkable speech on this occasion. Accountants may accompany the process, but can't be leaders if pricing is not there. And pricing is both of the essence and extremely challenging, as shown in France recently, with the Gilets Jaunes reacting violently to a carbon tax. The road towards ESG will be bumpy and will require great political skills as well as specific and effective transition tools. This has been well analyzed in a recent and excellent paper published by Brogo. In summary, IFRS has been a remarkable story for the EU, and the EU has been a remarkable supporter on the world stage for IFRS and global standards. A classic win-win for both sides. IFRAG role should be commended for its positive contribution to this success. Nonetheless, these gains cannot be taken for granted and need be protected, particularly when discussing topics such as the European interest. And finally, we'll stand supportive of efforts to improve and standardize ESG reporting and of the contribution to accountants where possible to this difficult task. We should not rely on accountants to be the ones that save our planet. Thank you. from us all for contributing to this event. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd now like to introduce our second keynote speaker. Uh, he comes from ESMA, and ESMA, as we've learned, is useful. <laughs> so Stephen has been the founding leader of ESMA since it was invented by the Commission. 
He's previously been a regulator, an academic, very sensible thing to have been. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you um, very much, uh, Patricia, for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much to Efrach and to uh, Jean-Paul Gosses for inviting me. It was very good to hear that, uh, indeed, ESMA is useful. I take it not only for picking up papers, but also more generally uh, for the role that we're playing in financial markets and specifically uh, in the area of accounting. Of course, that is tongue-in-cheek. I know how much you uh, value ESMA and how important uh, you have been in establishing ESMA and also had a strategic vision to give us direct supervisory powers, which has been really essential uh, to um, uh, give a clear role to ESMA in the, in the financial markets. What I would like to talk about uh, in my contribution, and they are uh, prepared remarks, they will be later today uh, on the website, is obviously the relationship between capital markets uh, and IFRS and also the role uh, of public authorities um, in that respect. And I would like to point that this year is the 10th anniversary uh, of two important events uh, reflecting on this relationship between public authorities uh, and accounting. The first being is that in January 2009, the monitoring board uh, was established. And as you know, the monitoring board uh, created the formal link between the foundation, the IFRS foundation, uh, and public authorities, and more specifically, uh, between uh, securities regulators, the European Commission, and the IFRS Foundation. But in the same year, another important event uh, was the publication of the La Rogère report. The La Rogère report was the founding, to some extent, the founding report of the authorities of the European supervisory authorities, including of ESMA. But the same report also uh, went into debate uh, on the role of accounting in the financial crisis and to what extent is uh, mark to market accounting uh, supporting long-term investment or to what extent is it hurting long-term investment? And in my view, there's been some unjustified criticism there on mark to market accounting. These initiatives, coupled with more recent ones, such as the resolutions of the European Parliament calling for a thorough assessment of IFRS 9 financial instruments and IFRS 17 insurance contracts, reflect the increasing scrutiny of public institutions on IFRS. This public scrutiny can ultimately be related to the same underlying question. Are IFRS still well suited to serve European capital markets? And I believe this is the case, and I will argue basically uh, in three separate elements uh, supporting this point around the support for European capital markets. The first one is the support for the capital markets union. The second one is that IFRS allows uh, good enforcement. Uh, and third, and finally, uh, I will talk around IFRS and technology and, um, and sustainability. Although I must say that probably I'm not more technical than Michel is, I still uh, have prepared myself to talk on that with a bit of help of other people in ESMA, I should say. But let me start by explaining why I believe that IFRS can be a major contributor to strengthening the capital markets union. IFRS, due to their focus on meeting the needs of users of financial information, have the potential to enable efficient capital market allocation, which is an important pillar of well-functioning capital markets. This also explains the long-standing collaboration between ESMA and the IFRS Foundation, which is rooted in the acknowledgement that high-quality accounting standards issued via an independent process and effectively enforced are a necessary premise to promote orderly markets that are well-functioned, that are well-functioning and where investors are protected. And in this respect, it's very good to see uh, Michel Prada here, uh, the chair, the former chair of the trustees of the foundation. We have built a very successful relationship, working relationship uh, between ESMA and the foundation. And I'm sure that will also continue under the leadership of Erki Likanen. And as I just said, strong capital market orientation of IFRS should help and should support the capital market union. One of the key objectives in the program of the Capital Markets Union is to ensure a broader participation by investors in the capital markets. And it's clear that a financial reporting system that responds to investor demands, to user demands, is crucial to support the Capital Markets Union. Let me then move to IFRS 
and EU accounting enforcement. And many of you will know is that right from 2011, when uh, ESMA was established, we've taken a significant role, uh, and even also our predecessor, Caesar, already did that, in terms of coordinating the supervision and enforcement of IFRS. The reason for doing that is that we know from academic research, you can have a high quality reporting system, but the benefits of a high quality reporting system will only be uh, come to, fruit to fruition uh, if it is combined with the proper institutional environment. And one of these elements of a proper institutional environment is credible enforcement uh, of the financial reporting system. That was also reflected already in the IS regulation uh, and in 2002, where the EU co-legislator said, indeed, strong enforcement should be part of the reporting system. And in that sense, I should say is that EU supervisory convergence has been well served by IFRS. First, the principles-based nature of IFRS offers a suitable basis for adapting to the inevitable variety of facts that occur in the reality of a business of businesses in a diverse jurisdiction such as the EU, while still enabling a sound and consistent approach to both implementation and enforcement. This is one of its key benefits for such diverse jurisdiction. jurisdiction. However, this combination of flexibility and rigor that is built into IFRS comes with the inevitable cost of leaving some room for interpretation to both issuers and enforcers. How should we then deal with the possibility of various interpretations that IFRS can create? ESMA's experience shows that when enforcement cases are collectively discussed by national authorities and the fact patterns are assessed in their entirety, even if the application of IFRS may not always be straightforward, the outcome of such extensive discussions is generally a converged one on how IFRS, how IFRS should be applied to the specific circumstances. And in that sense, it's, I just uh, had a brief exchange that in my role at ESMA, I hardly ever get accounting issues coming to the Board of Supervisors because basically this is dealt with at technical level, while in many other areas our technicians uh, cannot agree and it ultimately gets to the Board of Supervisors. Supervisors, I must say only in very few cases, accounting issues rise to the level of the Board of Supervisors. However, if there's still a lack of clarity in the reading of IFRS, ESMA submits a request to the IFRS Interpretations Committee, which would then either clarify the matter by issuing an agenda decision or an interpretation, or revert back to the ISB for standard setting. Uh, and in that sense, it will not surprise you is that we do not, ESMA does not support the issuance of national or regional implementation guidance of IFRS. We think that is contrary to the IS regulation. Uh, we are obviously in favor as a European body for consistent application of IFRS across the EU. And we also think that it will make us less effective uh, as a voice in the global debate on accounting when we would support uh, regional uh, guidance for IFRS. Of course, it is then important in such a situation where we resist to give additional guidance is that subsequently the IFRS Interpretations Committee and the ISB acts when there are such interpretation issues. In this respect, agenda decisions represent a suitable basis to provide clarifications on the application of IFRS, including when they depict the thought process that issues are expected to follow in conducting the accounting analysis for complex transactions, as recent agenda decisions on IFRS 15, revenue from contracts for customers, have shown. However, it is important to avoid that agenda decisions or other forms of educational material issued by the ISB result in new requirements which would then be difficult to enforce given that their source is not an endorsed IFRS interpretation and not part of the European regulatory framework. However, I should also admit that the principles-based nature of IFRS may sometimes make our enforcement work more challenging. In fact, depending on the national enforcement systems, the reliance on principles instead of more prescriptive requirements may make it difficult for enforcers to take action and challenge the practices of issuers. This is why it is important that disclosure objectives are clearly articulated and coordinated with more granular disclosure requirements in order to assist enforcers in challenging the practices of issuers that may tick the box 
and comply with the detailed disclosure requirements, but still falls short of providing sufficient information to meet a specific disclosure objective. A second aspect by which IFRS contributes to the effective enforcement is linked to their ability to provide accounting convictions that fairly reflect the underlying economic reality of the business while avoiding excessive complexity. As enforcement is not limited to a binary compliance exercise, but also requires assessing the quality of the information reported vis-a-vis -vis the underlying economic substance or the economic transactions, this feature of IFRS is particularly important when enforcers assess whether the information reported <coughs> properly informs investors. And let me give you one example regarding the treatment of equity instruments in IFRS 9. I guess that this selection of this case is not completely a coincidence by my staff. This issue has recently attracted much debate in accounting fora, also thanks to the two requests for advice issued by the European Commission to EFRA. The predecessor standard of IFRS 9, IS 39, provided a principle for the impairment of equities classified as available for sale with a set of indicators to implement that principle. ESMA's research and experience of European enforcers indicated that this approach was complex and led to significant divergence in practice. Academic research, but as I think also practical enforcement experience, showed that the use of the AFS category allowed for opportunistic profit-taking behavior by some issuers, which in some cases were contrary to the alleged intention to hold the equities as a strategic or long-term investment. Subsequent attempts by the ISB to reinforce this principle and to explore potential rules did not succeed, and ultimately the ISB decided to develop a different convention i.e. the classification at fair value through other comprehensive income with no recycling, which is still debated today. I will not explain, I understand this, I fully am aware that this is a very hot topic. Uh, we have made clear our position, we maintain our position uh, on this topic, also because ultimately this is to the benefit of investor protection, to the benefit of the users of financial statements. But let me stop here, I think our views on this point are well known. Let me then move to the remaining two topics, which is indeed financial technology, new electronic reporting and sustainability, and the role of IFRS in that respect. Let's project ourselves in the very near future where the considerations that I have developed in relation to the enforcement of IFRS will occur on the basis of electronic reports prepared according to the European Single Electronic Format, or ESEF. As you may all know by now, starting from the reporting period to 2020, the ESEF regulation requires issuers to present their consolidated financial statements in inline XBRL format. For the first two reporting periods, the obligation will cover only the phase financials included in the primary statements. So the statements of comprehensive income, statement of financial position, cash flow statement, and statement of changes in equity to then extend to the entire financial statements, including the notes by 2022. The existence of a complete and well-developed IFRS taxonomy was essential for ESMA in developing the ESEF. The availability of ESEF financial statements will open up new opportunities for users, investors, and accounting enforcers thanks to the improved usability of reported information. At the same time, ESEF will also allow a clearer and more immediate understanding of how the source data from issuers have been compiled by data aggregators, thus improving the quality and consistency of the data provided by these platforms. The quantity and quality of available data relating to SMEs from data aggregators uh, will also potentially improve without requiring massive efforts, thanks to the availability of the source data directly from the issuer's ESEF's financial statements. And for us, as accounting enforcers, I would not expect that we become or that we will introduce such an issue as robo-enforcement, but definitely the uh, availability of electronic information will help both the national supervisors and us at the European level. At a national level, obviously, it will help to compile time series for individual issues, issuers and see uh, certain risks developing over time based on this information. And it will also help to do it across issuers and across reporting periods. And so 
definitely I think that ESIF will help to reduce the risks uh, of data collection uh, and also the time-consuming involvement that is required with the massive manipulation uh, of data. Uh, and that will help, for example, also with the thematic reviews that we sometimes do on the basis of published financial statements, in this case then ESEF reports, and also identifying the topics that will ultimately end up in our enforcement priorities that, as you know, we publish on an annual basis. In a nutshell, thanks to the availability of a single taxonomy, moving into electronic reporting will further amplify the benefits of harmonization under IFRS as set out in the IS regulation by helping rationalize the diverse presentation and reporting practices. At the same time, the use of a single taxonomy will still preserve the flexibility permitted by IFRS by allowing ad hoc extensions to the core uh, ESEF taxonomy. We expect that further benefits in terms of rationalization of the presentation practices will arise thanks to the forthcoming proposals on the ISB's project on the primary financial statements. Let me now move to the topic of sustainability, and, and we already received some very, very wise words on the topic from Michel uh, Prada. When talking about this issue, typically the world is seen as two different silos, where on the one hand you have IFRS, uh, and on the other hand, you have the non-financial non information. However, when thinking about the complex and inextractable nature of business operations, they occur in a multi-stakeholder environment and they are affected by factors and give rise to effects, which in part only can immediately and relatively easily be described in the form of monetary items and financial trends. This leads me to two main considerations. First, to continue being relevant, IFRS need to consider how future projections, which are already required to be made, for example, in the case of impairment calculations, need to take into account risks arising from aspects relating to sustainability risks and opportunities. If an issuer is exposed to the risk of stranded assets, it cannot continue to account for them as if such risks do not exist. I think IFRS already include principles that cater for such forward-looking considerations, but perhaps a close look into this matter may be useful to raise awareness among both IFRS adopters and also the users of IFRS information. Second, we need to acknowledge that there are a number of economic realities that are not well suited to be recognized via the double entry system of accounting, which are nevertheless increasingly important. Investors request more and more transparency on the ESG disclosures, and issuers still seem to struggle to close this expectation gap. The result is a significant risk of exposing investors and other market participants to greenwashing practices. To respond to the increasing and genuine demands from the investor community for reliable ESG disclosures, we can learn a lot here from the success story of IFRS reporting in Europe. ESMA stands ready to support the European Commission to take further steps into this direction. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it is time to conclude, but let me make a few more remarks. First of all, I strongly believe that ESMA should remain focused on depicting economic reality in a neutral way. Some of these words were already also expressed by Michel Prada. And in, in addition to that, an independent governance process needs to oversee the development uh, and the endorsement of IFRS. And in that way, I think IFRS can make the biggest contribution to long-term investments. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that IFRS information, although it remains very important, only tells part of the story. It is therefore necessary to bring non-financial information to a level of maturity that is comparable to that of IFRS information and achieve more transparency on non-financial information to complement IFRS financial statements. This will enable investors and other stakeholders to further assess the potential for value creation by issuers. To help this process, it is urgent to update the non-financial reporting directive and to complement it with binding measures that specify in more detail principles and requirements for the preparation of non-financial disclosures. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention and very good to be here today.
Well, interesting views from the standard setting world, from the regulation world. We'd now like to move to our first panel. Should IFRS be more rules-based to support en enforcement? So can I ask our panel members to come up, please? And Pavansh and Alain. All of you. Let's get, rather than having everybody moving multiple times, Pavansh. So we're going to start the panel with a with Pavench Berrier setting the scene. Pavench knows even more about being in the European Parliament than Jean Paul, because 25 years I counted, and <laughs> fingers. And then I'm going to ask Somebody? Elaine, who is in charge of just about everything at the European Commission, <laughs> corporate reporting, both financial and non-financial credit rating agencies, and I'm sure you're planning some more empire building, and I'll leave you to introduce your pal and Elaine. Thank you very much. Thank you to Efrag. Thank you to Jean-Paul Gauzet. It's for my voice. Um, I'm very pleased to follow up uh, after uh, Stephen Mayer and uh, Michel Prada. I realize now that uh, Jean-Paul Gouzès is a truly English-speaking uh, chair of EFRAG because he cannot deliver a speech without uh, uh, an element of humor, which is, of course, a very British practice. Um, thank you, uh, Michel Prada, for raising our old stories because the three items you have identified, like items that are behind us, I'm not so sure they are behind us, and, but they've been among us for all the time we've been working on this topic since the beginning. And you said uh, that some of these questions do mainly maybe come from a country we know quite well. Well, allow me to say that sometimes in this country people do raise questions that in the end allow them to deserve a Nobel Prize like this year. So maybe it's worth raising some of these questions. And. Um, to Steve Mayer, of course, I have to apologize <laughs> that I didn't give you more job uh, while finishing my uh, mandate because I would have wished that you would have more um, enforcement power uh, and more direct supervision over some of these market participants. But as you know, there were some resistance, not only from the market. Um, but I also would like to share with you in my new capacity as member of the French market authority that has a settled a, a committee to work on uh, climate and sustainable finance uh, as a committee, uh, that uh, your last wish that uh, we move ahead uh, on the non-financial reporting is absolutely key, and I will come back to this in my introduction to our round table. Um, for me, um, this uh, question uh, needs to go back to why do we need to make sure that um, IFRS or more broadly accounting standards are implemented or enforced? Well, first you need to make sure, as all of you uh, repeatedly were going on with, that they're effective, relevant, efficient. But the purpose uh, of it, uh, we need to have it clearly in mind. And there's a, a dual objective. And I learned a long time ago from Jean-Claude Trichet that it's very difficult for people to have two objectives to follow in a row. And here, the two objectives you want to follow is on the one hand, stability. I know Michel Prasad said that he doesn't care about stability. It's not the task. IFRS, I don't agree. So I still believe uh, one of the reasons you want to have standards, accounting standards, is to make sure that at some stage, you can find out what's going on in the market and that the market is not com completely opaque, completely crazy. So the question of stability is still a question for me. And the second question is, of course, the question of fair competition uh, in a fair market. And I think these two targets doesn't uh, tell you exactly uh, the same thing you need when you look at is it better to be ruled or principle-based uh, when it comes to the enforcement of the accounting. And um, 
the the the, the last uh, item I would like to put in terms of objective is one that Michel Prada will not like either, which is the European public goods. Uh, there was another big uh, prominent uh, stakeholder in this debate, namely uh, Philippe Mestat, and he has clearly introduced this idea of a European public goods when we discuss um, um, affairs. I don't want to oppose um, Philippe Mestat and Michel Prada, but I'm just saying that um, uh, there are some truths behind maybe both of them. Um, you see, I'm a real MEP, uh, still. Um, nevertheless, I think, just let me, allow me. I, I know I go on top of our topic right now, but allow me just this. The EU has been the leader landscape for the implementation of IFRS. IFRS, and everybody will agree with me, it was created because the EU existed, because the EU was not able itself to create its own European standard, uh, accounting standards. So we wanted it. We, we complained that it, when it was there, but then we were the one to implement it. So it's in the, in, it's in the heart of the nature of these international standards to uh, um, deliver for the European internal market. This is the first reason why it was created. Um, nevertheless, uh, we are now facing new challenges. And um, somehow, both of you said it, um, in these challenges, I think the EU will take a lead. So call it European public goods or not, if the EU is gonna take the lead, it means when we discuss what is coming out from the ISB, there is a, a common understanding, uh, a social cohesion, or a social mo uh, or an intellectual model in the EU that is willing uh, the IFRS to move in a direction that is maybe in a dynamic and I, that is maybe not completely immediately foreseeable around the table of the IFRS. So a space for a European public goods debate. Now, um, should enforcement be more easy if you have a principle or rule-based approach? For me, it really looks like a very, very old story. Because I, when I first learned about accounting standards, that was a long time ago, before I had white hair, um, it used to be a very uh, black and white debate the US would go for the rules and the EU would go for the principle. Uh, I'm happy that this debate is still alive, but I can see that uh, there is no clear answer for this. And if you go for a certain sense of uh, bon sens, you can have drivers. Um, if you have a principle-based approach, it's for sure that you will be able to embrace, embrace a wider uh, reality, that you will be more open to innovation, that you will be more open to a tailor-made approach. Well, if you go for a rule-based, of course, then you go for a situation where for a market player, it's much more easy to get a, 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 a full comparison of the situation. But if you go back to my principal uh, my, the target I recall, which is also about stability and having a clear picture of what the market looks like and the stakeholder of the market. Well, I think you want the, the idea that you need a principle-based approach to allow some tailor-made approach, I think, uh, worth being mentioning. Of course, this principle debate um, about accounting standards and IFRS, I cannot avoid to refer to other fields where we had this debate. And uh, if I look at uh, the Basel uh, work, they also had the, to, to face the situation. Should they go for the standard approach or should, you, should they allow the internal model? And you can see 
that uh, even though if we had to defend the European public goods because the US wanted to kill the internal model, um, uh, I think the EU was right to, 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 to fight for this internal model approach that is more principle-based approach than a strictly uh, rule-based. Um, but when it comes also to the growth and stability pact, don't tell me it has nothing to, to, to do with our topic, it does. When you have a growth stability pact, which is only rule-based approach, the enforcement is a nightmare. It's a nightmare because then you don't uh, uh, have the picture, the full picture of the reality. So what you do, you go back to uh, the, the, the standard setter and you make it more complex. And so it's even more costly and it's even less readable. And so you go back to the idea that you should avoid uh, too much rule-based approach and go back to a, a principle-based approach. And this is the element of good sense I think I should put in this introduction to our debate because it would fit uh, very properly to, uh, to, to our round table. Allow me before concluding two or three uh, remarks on the context in which we are. It's been already mentioned by uh, the opening speech, but I think the fact that how do you enforce accounting standards uh, in the current dynamic, you need to take into account four elements that are quite new. The first one is uh, uh, something I believe we all regret, but it's the ongoing debate on Brexit. Uh, it will change uh, the, the, the enforcement for many of the companies in the EU. How do they deal with this uh, uh, new dynamic on the market? Second, accounting standards, they were in the beginning mainly settled to enlight uh, 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 and to, 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 to allow fair information for some stakeholders on the market. But today, there are many newcomers to this debate on the financial market and on the market. And you cannot have accounting standards that NGO and uh, other stakeholders uh, in the society cannot understand and cannot exploit. And this is, I think, a new element. I don't know if it's a European public goods, but at least it, has, it was not in the, in, the, in the mandate of the IFRS in the beginning, and we do need to, to, to have it in mind. Um, third, the digitalization. Um, I don't know if my level of competence is higher or not than uh, Michel Prada, but I do know that it completely changed the question, of course, also of the enforcement, because when you will have um, uh, 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 um, artificial intelligence, of course, if you have a rule-based approach, it's much easier for the uh, uh, AI to, to be uh, using the, these data. Is it the only reason to go for a fully rule-based approach? I'm not so sure. The last point, of course, is sustainability and, and, and long-term investment. I will not uh, uh, be too long on this topic because everybody has it in mind. And, um, but, of course, this new item uh, um, is a plea in favor of a more principle-based approach since it would open some room for maneuver for innovation. Um, last point that I wanted to mention is that, of course, if you want to have good enforcement, whether it is a rule-based or a principle-based approach, you need to have a proper impact assessment process at all levels, and you also need to have a good governance. And this, I think, is in the hand of ESMA and other national uh, authority. But it was been mentioning because uh, if you are fully confident on the um, uh, enforcement authority, you may leave more room for a, a principle-based approach. If you have no confidence, obviously you want to go to a fully rule-based approach. But then you end up in the mess uh, in the debate like you had on the stability and growth pact because you don't 100% know how to implement it. So this is the maybe provocative uh, note I wanted to introduce. Um, before uh, introducing this uh, panel, I had the same question to uh, Jean-Paul Gauzès and uh, Michel Prada. I told him, what do you want me to say? 
And he told me, say what you want, and I know that you will be uh, putting some new challenge on the table. I don't know if I delivered the mandate, but I'm sure the, the topic we are going to address is not so old-fashioned one, and I'm happy to contribute to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pervenche. Uh, and I hope your voice survives until the end of the panel. Uh, we look very much for, uh, to hearing uh, more from you. So a lot of food for thought there. We've already heard from three very distinguished speakers. Um, I'm glad that uh, Pervenche has demonstrated that even amongst compatriots, there is room for disagreement. And I hope that in this multinational and multi-stakeholder panel, there will always also perhaps be room for disagreement to make it more interesting. Um, and really, this is a perfect topic to start a religious war about, uh, as we know from previous discussions about rules versus principles. So I'll start very quickly by introducing uh, the panel. You all have biographies in the documents I think you have received, so I won't read out everything, uh, but very quickly, uh, again, to emphasize that we have a multi-stakeholder pa uh, panel. We have Carsten, who uh, comes from the auditing profession, uh, has uh, uh, important pos positions of responsibility in, in uh, PwC, where he leads uh, global accounting, consulting, financial services, and I note also um, innovation and digitization in accounting, so that is also a very relevant uh, aspect in light of, uh, of what we have heard already today. Um, to uh, Carsten's left, we have Hans Boeser, who is uh, uh, a well-known uh, to everybody who uh, participates in EFRAG and, and in the EFRAG orbit, since he is a board member of EFRAG. Uh, Hans uh, is also chairman of the Belgian uh, Association of Financial Analysts, and he is also in the EFAS. Uh, executive, executive Committee and also in, uh, is the chairman of uh, XBRL International, which is another very important forum for uh, the debate about digitization. Um, to Hans's left, we have uh, Tina Sve, uh, who is, comes from the uh, supervisory community. Uh, uh, Tina leads um, IFRS and financial reporting enforcement in the Norwegian Financial Supervisory Authority, and uh, in that capacity, <coughs> naturally also participates in European fora such as ESMA and EFRAG. Uh, to Tina's left, we have Araceli Mora, who uh, is a full professor of accounting at the University of Valencia. And I must say, looking at the weather that makes uh, over here today, that makes me very jealous, because it would <laughs> yes. be very nice to be in Valencia at this stage. Sure. Um, Araceli is also very well known to the EFRAG community, since uh, she, has, she is a past uh, EFRAG TEG member uh, for, for many years. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, also works on uh, quite a range of, of, of topics uh, at, at, at national and, and, and European lo uh, level. And then finally, uh, Klaas uh, is also well known to the EFRAG community since he is also an EFRAG board member. Uh, represents, uh, I think on this panel, the preparer community, if I can put it that way, since uh, he is the director of accounting at the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise uh, since 2009. Does a lot of other things, but I'll yeah. keep it short to, so that we can move on to the debate. Pervenche, you have been introduced already, you are known to everybody, so I guess I don't need to introduce you again. Um, my uh, leading memory of uh, Pervenche is, I think, in about 2008, uh, when you shouted at me in the corridors of the European Parliament because you didn't like what we were doing. But anyway, we have continued to have a, 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 a good working relationship since then. Um, so let's perhaps, uh, to start off with, um, uh, look at, uh, turn to the audience so that we can already start involving you. And you have the wonderful Slido tool. Um, and we have a, uh, a sort of general question just to get a feeling for the lay of the land and what are your opinions in, in the audience. It's a, it's a quite general question, so are mandatory standards by themselves enough for enforcement? But what it's really about, I think, is getting a range of views between those of you who think that it should all be about principles, going all the way to the position uh, uh, that no, it should all be about rules. And hopefully we won't have too many people who don't actually have an opinion. So uh, let's give that a little bit of time. Um, everybody's plumping for the middle. No, there's actually quite a lot of people who are principles enthusiasts. Uh, okay, so 
a bit of uh, there, there, there's nobody who, who, who wants to be uh, who wants the standards to be all about rules, which oh, there is one person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so a range of views, but generally more towards the sort of principles end the end of, of, of the spectrum. So um, turning now to our panelists, perhaps we can start with. Um, uh, from the enforcement perspective, since uh, that is uh, has already been mentioned also by uh, Stephen, uh, uh, that this has a th this question has an important bearing on 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 how standards are enforced. So Tina, what do you think? Are mandatory standards uh, su sufficient to for enforcement, or do we need to look at other qualitative characteristics? First of all, I believe that uh, accounting standards need to be uh, mandatory to be enforceable. Uh, otherwise, uh, enforcers cannot require issues to correct their financial statements. We could, of course, encourage them to do changes in their financial reporting in order to improve it, which we also do, uh, but that is not enforcement in my view. In a principle-based regime, we need guidance to understand the principle and to apply them. We need, uh, we need um, to understand the reasoning behind the principle in order to understand the objective, and we need a guidance on how to assess the application of a principle in a specific case. What are relevant factors in that um, assessment and what are not relevant factors? I believe that the guidance should be within, uh, included in the standards. But since it is the principles uh, we enforce, also, guidance outside the standard could be useful as long as they support the principle in the standard. And by that, I mean a basis for conclusions, um, uh, implementation guidance, practice statement, and also agenda decisions from the interpretation committee. In order to apply accounting principles, uh, issues often have to use uh, judgments. And I think we should acknowledge that uh, there um, is a room for judgment and that different uh, assessment or interpretation uh, applications uh, could be acceptable. The role of the enforcer is not to replace the issue's uh, judgment with our own judgment, but to assess if the issue's judgment is reasonable. Uh, that means go into and assess the issues assessment up against the principle in the standard uh, and the um, guidance available. If the issues judgment is not reasonable, uh, the enforcer should um, uh, take action and, if necessary, require the issue to correct the financial statements. But to assess what is reasonable is, of course, not an easy task. And we have a lot of discussion about this in my office and also with other enforcers. To be able to do this task properly, it is important to have a good understanding of the issue's business and environment, meaning the facts and circumstances, uh, the reasoning for the issue's assessment, uh, and of course the requirements in the standard. And that would require high expertise and could be time consuming, uh, but in my opinion, that is necessary to be able to enforce principle-based standards. Another aspect is that issuers need to provide disclosure about their judgments. Uh, and to assess whether those disclosures are sufficient is also an important part of enforcement. As I said, I think, principle -based, um, I, I think principles need guidance to be enforceable. Take, for example, IFRS 10 and the control aspects. It is not, that it is not enough that the standard states you should uh, consolidate uh, investi if you control it. We need to understand what, con what uh, uh, kind of control to assess, and we need to, uh, to know what kind of rights and activities that give the investor power to control and investi. The application guidance provides information and also examples on how to do that assessment. It is a lot of judgment in that assessment, but still, uh, with the guidance available, I think the principle is enforceable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
We'll turn now to Klaas, who you represent people who are on the receiving end In of Tina's uh, attentions yeah, yeah. Uh, and her colleagues' attentions. Yeah. So what is your view on this? F first of all, to answer the general question, I would say that, yes, uh, it's... Um, uh, it's, it's sufficient to have mandatory standards that should be enforced, and that's the whole key, so to say. We, what we're talking about is to have a standard or a number of standards that should be enforced, and that should be the scope, so to say. Uh, another thing is, of course, to, to uh, then how to draft the standard out of the principles, going back to the framework, so to say, which should be drilled down into standards. Uh, in order to make it operational, of course, you need to have some kind of, let's call it comprehensive standard, uh, whatever that means that make, can make it workable, not only from a uh, enforcer perspective, but also from a prepared perspective, because if you get the new standard now, the first thing is to implement it, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the firms, and, and in order to do that, you, know, it's, you need to have it rather comprehensive, so to say, without going into details, because as Tin is saying, one very key f feature here is to have a drafting of a standard that will allow the firm to apply its specific facts and circumstances to the transaction and let it then be reflected through the financial reporting. So that, that is a key here. So if you're trying to make it too rule-based, you might also end up in a situation where you, you get one type of transaction at one time, you write something about it, and the next year the transaction pattern will, will be different, and you then say, oh, it does not fit anymore. So that's one of the challenges you always have. But to, 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 uh, to answer your question, that, that it's, um, it's enough. Then you can see also you have to make the distinction here between what will come up in the second panel between enforcing a standard and what is then, there is a need for interpretation, of course, because that's always the case, not only accounting standards, if you look into legislation, for example, any kind of legislation that needs to be interpreted. So that, it's in, I think it's important to keep that apart. Um, so, um, and I also think that uh, one key important feature of enforcement is to say, that what, what, what is the role of enforcement here? Well, my, my, my understanding is that here that enforcement should make sure that you don't have material deviation or material misstatements that can mislead investors and or the market. That's, that's a key feature here. And so that is the most important thing, uh, not to fulfill all each and every little detail, so to say, what might come, come out of, of an accounting standard. Thank you very much. Um, so you've mentioned interpretation, mm. uh, which is a nice uh, lead-in to the next question, mm. um, which is what, what, what should enforcers do if there's a lack mm. of guidance in, in the market? And, and, and I'll address that question to Carsten, who is perhaps the most, well, the best placed person to answer it for a reason which I forgot to mention earlier, which is that he is a member of the IFRS Interpretations Committee. Uh, so Carsten, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what do you recommend to enforcers if, if they encounter a lack of guidance uh, or a lack of clarity in standards? Right, Th thanks Alan. Um, so I, I guess I'd start by saying what I would, what enforcers should not do. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, my view is that enforcers should not engage in standard setting. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, perspective is probably shared by the ESMA as indicated in the um, ESMA guidelines on enforcement of financial information. So um, that's a starting point, I think. And then I think that my next um, step would be, you know, to, to look at what companies should do when there's a lack of guidance in the standards. And once you have to assess what companies should do, you can then answer the question about, you know, what should enforcers do if there's a lack mm -hmm. of guidance in the standard. So um, actually, I think IS-8 has some pretty specific guidance on what to do if there's a lack of guidance in the standards. Um, and basically what the um, IS-8 hierarchy tells you to do is, you know, you, if there's no uh, guidance that applies in specifically in a standard to a particular transaction, you then look at whether there are other IFRS standards that apply to similar or related types of transactions. So, so that's what you do, what the company does, and then uh, if that's not the case, you look at you know, other sources. Um, first at the conceptual framework, whether there's anything there that may uh, help an entity to select, um, let's say, a reasonable accounting policy. Um, and then there's other considerations, such as looking at um, authoritative guidance from other standard setters, you know, such as US GAAP, 
uh, perhaps other accounting literature. Um, I guess mainly, you know, for, for example, the um, the accounting menus of the large firms um, or accepted industry practice. So you have pretty clear guidance on that. Uh, in fact, uh, I think just last week, um, a guide came out from the IFRS Foundation explaining a little bit more around that. Um, and so that's what a company should do, I think. And now coming back to your, to your original question, what should enforcers do? I think it's up to the enforcers then to to assess whether you know a company has made a reasonable judgment mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in applying that IS8 hierarchy, um, and whether that's within you know within the range of what's what's acceptable. So I think that's the the, the broad direction um, I would recommend. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Since uh, this is also about y your role, uh, do you want to? Add anything to that, or contradict anything that Carson has said, perhaps? Yes, <laughs> not contradict, <laughs> but uh, I believe that interpretation sh should be done by the interpretation committee and not by enforcers. Yeah. Um, the role of enforcers is to assess the application of standards, uh, and that needs to be based on what is in the standard, the principle, uh, the guidance, or the rules. Uh, w when uh, there is uncertainty about uh, an issuer's accounting treatment and if it is in accordance with the standard, it could be because it is uncertainty about facts and circumstances uh, in the specific case, or it could be uncertainty about what is meant in the standard. Mm. And I think the enforcers should deal with the first one and not the second. Mm. Um, but to distinguish between interpretation and application is not always uh, an easy task. Uh, we, uh, we regularly um, uh, discuss this in the European and Forces Coordination Session in ESMA, also known as EEZS. And borderline cases is also discussed uh, informally with ISB staff to ensure that we do not interpret standards. And as uh, Stephen Mayur uh, mentioned, uh, ESMA also submits an uh, issue to the Interpretation Committee uh, in areas where there has been difficult to enforce and where we believe the issue would benefit from uh, agenda decision and interpretation or standard setting. So even if uh, uh, enforcers do not do interpretations, I believe it could be useful for uh, users and issuers to look at enforcement decisions to see how a specific case is dealt with, how a principle is applied on a specific uh, facts and circumstances, could provide a deeper understanding of the principle, of the accounting principle, even if facts and circumstances uh, is not exactly, exactly the same for another issue. And I think that's the same with agenda decisions. Uh, and uh, I appreciate how the committee had dealt with this uh, agenda decision in uh, recent years, especially for the new standards. Mm. I think they are very useful, both for uh, issues, but also for auditors and enforcers. Thank you very much. Uh, well, agenda decisions, I suspect, is, is something that we're going to continue hearing about for a while, because, of yeah. course, it is an important element in the recent consultations that the, uh, the, the, the foundation has been, has, has been doing. Um, so quite a lot of different sources of information uh, that uh, enforcers can, can turn to. Um, there is another beast in the zoo of accounting, or at least of reporting, which is called uh, um, um, practice statements, educational material. Uh, ISB, again, is working at the moment on the practice statement on, on, on uh, management, management commentary. Um, perhaps if I can turn to, to, to class again, uh, how do you see the role of this type of document, it's kind of voluntary standards or, or practice statements? Yeah, just to narrow it down a little bit, because if we talk about voluntary standards, we can't we can get into non-financial reporting, so I would restrict myself in this scope to, to talk about uh, IFRS and financial reporting. Well, and the, the answer would be, I'm, I'm a typical Swede, so it, will, it depends, <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, just give two examples. There are two real-life examples here what we have. The first one is the management commentary from, from the ISBs that came out in 2010. 
And the other one is the more recently re released practice statement on materiality. So I think you should have the distinction between those two. Mm -hmm. Regarding the management commentary, my, my, let's say like this, that I think from a preparer's side, we were not very positive from the beginning when it was introduced for different reasons. First of all, it was not standard. Uh, secondly, we have serious doubts about conceptual f foundation for issuing such a statement. Um, and there were also other sources available. Uh, so m to my recollection, we, we have not had a lo large discussion about the management commentary after that. I think the reason for that is that since this is, rule, this is regulated by jurisdiction, so to say, how should the management be drafted for in a specific EU member state is what governs this. So this means that um, the real impact of this kind of, of management commentary can only be seen if, if the national uh, uh, legislator, standard settler, uh, draw something out of the management commentary to say to use it, find it, find it useful, so to say. Uh, but I don't think it will have a direct impact on the specific preparer unless it goes through the, the uh, regulator. So this means that we are, I've also encountered discussions where in specific jurisdictions say there was kind of gap in, in uh, guidance, so say where well, some will say that it was useful to fill out the gap, so to say, on a national level, uh, because there was nothing. So, but you have to distinguish that from the situation, say that, well, this is best practice, because that is something else to, to take it one step further. So I think that the real problem here is that since there is no European uh, legislation on this area, Therefore, you have a great diversification between the member states, and that's a real problem. And this is also an explanation why this type of material will not have, uh, have not had any great effect uh, in, in European context, while it might be different in other jurisdictions. The other example regarding materi the materiality statement, on the other hand, uh, you could say this is something to try to bring more guidance to something that is already in IFRS, which is a key feature, of course, how to apply materiality. I think that from a preparer's side, the discussion here was to say that we had a long discussion about should be in the standard, should be a practice statement or not, and we settled or said, I probably think it's better that it is a practice statement. But is there, compared to the management commentary, any benefit out of it? Well, it, in order to have a knowledge-based answer, we'd have to go through and make a survey out of that. But our initial reaction was at least to say that this was probably something that could help in the dialogue with auditors, uh, with regulators, and among preparers. So uh, from a general point of view, I think that this kind of practice statement was seen more in more positive terms than management commentary. OK, thank you very much. I think you were tempting fate by pronouncing the words, there is no European legislation nah, nah. in front, I of, in back, front of a commission <laughs> official, because the answer is, of course, we're working. Yes, of course, uh, but it's not, uh, it's not especially detailed, as I would say, so uh, put it in the management. Small no, but we, we can make it more detailed. Users. We can make it more detailed. Yeah. Um, small, small comment from users, are you sure we need that? Well, that's... Uh, yeah. Well, the, uh, the impact assessment will I, answer I, that. And are you question. sure we want that? Okay. <laughs> well, we can talk about it. We can okay. talk about it. Um, Carsten, um, Klaas has just mentioned the example of the practice statement on materiality. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a member of the uh, interpretations committee, uh, how do you see this? Do you see this as, your, as, as, as the staff or, uh, or, or, or others trying to usurp the role of the interpretation committee? Or is this something that you're comfortable with? Uh, living alongside uh, interpretations? Uh, not that much, really. Uh, I think maybe perhaps stepping, uh, stepping back. Um, I think, you know, if you were talking about IFRS and voluntary statements, I actually think there are effectively two categories. One is mandatory standards that are not yet effective, so they are voluntary for, for, for a limited period of time. And I think you know, that's the first category where obviously I think enforcement you know, applies in the same way as, um, as uh, mandatory standards if an entity has uh, elected to early apply an IFRS, right? So that's one category. If we're moving on to practice statements, which, you know, are non-mandatory and remain non-mandatory over time, um, I think, you know, this is non-binding, um, 
work of the, um, of the ISB that's intended to support entities with certain issues that arise, for example, in certain jurisdictions or to make certain judgments around materiality. <coughs> So I think for those, you know, non-compliance with, since it's not an IFRS, non-compliance with the practice statement would not result in an entity, uh, you know, not complying with IFRS if they otherwise do so. And um, so I think for, for, for this type of voluntary standards, um, I think, you know, it's, um, you know, it's obviously then with this background hard to enforce um, if entities are not even, required to apply it, right? Uh, and I, d I don't see that we get a lot of questions on that uh, at the IFRIC um, and wouldn't personally expect that there's a lot of enforcement issues around that um, given its voluntary nature. Okay, thank you very much. We'll give the panel a break now um, and we'll turn back to the audience uh, and back to our wonderful Slido widget. Um, and we have another question for you. So, uh, no, it wasn't about America. Uh, okay, so in, 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 uh, in discussing rules versus principles, you could imagine that if we had rules, it would very much favor comparability, whereas if you have principles, it can be a lot more flexible in reflecting the, the circumstances of each, enti of each reporting entity. So um, in that uh, spectrum, uh, where would you place yourself? Um, you know, is comparability more important or is uh, reflecting the entity-specific circumstances uh, more important. So, quite a strong view in favor of reflecting the specificities of each company's business model, although quite a number of people also uh, considering clearly that comparability, which is one of the qualitative criteria uh, in the conceptual framework, I believe, uh, is, is also important. Okay, with that then, thank you very much for your participation. We'll turn back to the audience, uh, to the, I'm sorry, to the panel. Um, and uh, we'll go to uh, Araceli now. Um, so, following up on the on the point we've just uh, we've just looked at rules giving perhaps more comparability versus uh, uh, principles uh, that uh, that reflect a, that allow the reflection of a, of of, a, of the specific circumstances of an entity. Uh, what, what what views do you have on the the way in which those two features interact? Well, my, my view is essentially from the accounting, uh, academic accounting perspective, so from the research perspective, but the research, empirical research. So what we call this relevance and comparability, there are two issues related with the quality of accounting information. And I've been just uh, hearing very often, and it has been argued, that rule-based standards uh, reduce opportunities for earnings management, which is a key issue for uh, the quality of accounting information. And the second thing that has been argued related with rule-based standards is that it uh, increases comparability. So I would like to, to mention that no one of these things is uh, true according to the empirical research, at least not entirely true. So for example, in the case of earnings management, uh, it's obvious that rule-based standards allow uh, structuring transactions, which is a kind of manipulation. Uh, we know that, for example, leasing accounting in the American case is quite obvious. But if we focus on earnings management specifically, there are two types of earnings management. Uh, accrual earnings management, so we're moving earnings from one period to the other, that's accounting earnings management, but there are also real earnings management, meaning that we act on earnings with real transactions, which is much more costly. So what the research says, it is inconclusive in terms of earnings accounting earnings management, but normally principle-based standards allow more accounting earnings management. But when research analyzes both things, accounting and real earnings management, it looks like total earnings management is higher with rule-based standards. So when we say that earnings management is easier to do, to practice earnings management with principle-based standards, we must be very cautious about that. That's not true, according to the empirical research. Uh, also, uh, abuse and dishonest behavior is related with incentives, not with accounting standards. So accounting standards cannot do anything against abuse or dishonest behavior, in theory. 
Uh, so if we want to act against that, we have to act sometimes with rules or legislation, but not related with accounting standards, related with other rules that can affect incentives uh, that are acting uh, on people, acting in a dishonest way. So that's in terms of uh, quality of account information. In terms of com comparability, uh, in fact, rules-based standards increases uniformity, which is not necessarily comparability. Uh, look as an example, uh, Bank of Spain, for example, have rules, very detailed rules, for considering impairment, which is the amount of impairment in the case of a delay. For example, 30 days delay, you must have this allowance. Uh, obviously, if you look at the individual transactions, the impairment of one transaction and another transaction with the same delay in terms of payment is not the same. So using the same amounts for these, obviously not the same transactions and situation, uh, is against comparability. So that's, that's an example. Also, you, we have to take into account that total comparability in a global uh, context is impossible to get. Not even desirable. For example, uh, research shows that uh, conservatism in practice with the same standard is required by investors in countries or in, in contexts where the governance is weak or the enforcement is weaker. So with the same standard, investors are demanding different practice according to the rest of the context of the situation in which uh, the, the company is, is, is acting. So to adapt to diversity and different environment, discretion is essential in this sense and, and helps comparability. And, and obviously, flexibility of discretion is necessary to, to get you to, to, for new situations, new business models, and so on. So principle-based standards in that sense is better. But however, we have to take into account that this works properly, all the analysis I have done above, uh, if certain assumptions are made. Two assumptions in particular are very important. First, that all parties should, should be willing to accept the consequences of judgment. So, for example, in some countries, auditors and enforcers are not so used to principle-based standards. And for them, in terms of education, training, and, 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 and character and culture, it's much more difficult. Um, so, training is, is, is very important. Also, the courage and independence of, of the auditors. That's essential. Mm -hmm. And the second thing which is very essential is disclosure. Some, some, uh, I think Stephen Major uh, was talking about the, the key point of disclosure. And um, enforcers have a, not just the, the standard setters, but also enforcers a, has an important role with disclosure. Because sometimes, as a reader of financial statements, I see like textbooks, 200 pages of notes, that is a textbook. It's nothing. Nothing is relevant there. So we, if we want to, 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 if we want just proper judgments, we need good disclosure and documentation behind these judgments. And if we have that, everything is working. If not, we have problems. So a good conceptual framework related with disclosure and a good attitude of enforcers in terms of disclosure, not just, it needs much more work, M much more work, much more training. That's obvious. And there are differences in different countries, in different contexts, but we need that. So in conclusion, a principle-based accounting standards in general better serves the, the needs of the investors, mainly in an international context. That's what the research says. Uh, but much more work must be done in, in, in some aspects, not necessarily in accounting standards. That's, that's the point. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Hans, as uh, Araceli has just mentioned, this whole contraption, this whole community is, that is sitting with us today is meant to serve the needs of the community that you represent, which are <laughs> investors. So um, I will uh, use uh, Jean-Paul's approach, say what you want uh, <laughs> about your views uh, on, on the usefulness of, uh, of, of all this work that is being done to serve your needs. Do you want to brief or long? Well, uh, I'll cut you off if you go for too long. But uh. Okay. No, the first idea, and it showed in, 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 the, in the software here, is the one does not exclude the other one, honestly speaking. Do we want comparability? Yeah, of course we do. That is exactly what we try to find. We're trying to find trends over time. Mm. We're trying to find a, a platform where we can compare the same companies uh, with throughout, or different companies throughout the same sector. Uh, that's logical. Does it mean we want to focus only 
on a rule-based approach, that is something for me completely different. It is true that rules will give users greater comparability. That is true. I'm not going to deny that. But of course, if you uh, respect a number of rules, eh, are rules a limitation to providing quality financial information? Eh, the answer is for me, no. If the rules are well-defined and complete. Eh. We heard before a uh, discussion on ASF, if the rules provide guidance on how to calculate financial data, they can only enhance comparability. They enhance two things. They enhance transparency. This is what you want, or we want as well. And they enhance comparability as well. That is why within the analyst community, not everywhere, and it took some time, we are more and more convinced that that comparability through a standard or through a language like we had within ASEF is something that we need. And yes, of course, since we work on an international level, you have to be honest, if you work in, 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 in the private investors market or even a public investors market, you're working throughout the globe. So it is important that we have this comparability. That's one thing. If we then look to, for instance, uh, the quality of what we have, well, it all depends. We can make every possible rule we want. But the real thing that is underneath there is the quality of the data that is used. Is that quality of data correct? And that is where, again, rules will play a certain role. Yeah. Then, of course, what do you do if you need, and we as, as analysts and investors often need uh, information that is not really covered by, let's say, obligatory ruling or obligatory rules. That was my reaction when you were speaking before. Uh, and here we get a, a, a role of, okay, what is the solution to this issue? And there's, again, a, a double solution on the one hand side. Yes, of course, if we have bigger rules, if we have better, bigger definitions, better definitions of what we mean with a certain saying, then it is going to enhance comparability, and I think the transparency of the market is being served. Does that mean that an analyst would love now to have you define every possible thing and put every possible thing in rules? I didn't say that, and I'm sure that the analyst community is saying, not at all, because there has to be room let's say, for interpretation. If you look at the company, on the one hand side, we want to start with a set of data that is easily comparable, so it gives us more time to look better at the entity-specific circumstances. So I think, as, as you mentioned before, training extra data is, is of the essence there. Uh, of course, the models are changing. Economy is changing, and so rules will always be lagging behind, whether we want it or not. So what are we going to do with new business models? Where, where are we working there? How do we achieve comparability there? So again, analysts are not asking for a, a rule-based, 100% perfect approach, but it has to be somewhere a framework of comparability that is going to be put forward using a number of rules. That is a little bit, I think, the most important parts of uh, what we found and what we discussed uh, internally. How important is comparability compared to entity-specific information? Does the one exclude the other is a question one might ask. I hope I have convinced you that any user, whether it is an analyst or it is a, a private investor, needs both, and the one should not at all exclude the other one. That again is where structured data and easy database access is key. Uh, we want to save time to be able to go deeper, and as such, the normal information that we find should be comparable, should be structured, and should be very easily accessible. And yes, in there was a remark my predecessor also gave, the role of auditors is crucial, because information that we get and that would be structured data needs to be comparable. So again, as analysts, we would like to have the auditors have a look at the structured data files, predominantly, and not only on the paper files. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. I was just double checking your biography there, and it confirms that you are an economist. And Lovely. as all economists, you're a two-handed economist <laughs> who says, on the one hand, uh, on the other hand, uh, and so uh, it's a very balanced answer that you've yeah. you, you've given. Um, can we maybe, uh, Pervenche, I, I hope your voice is recovered a little bit because we're going to come back to you soon. Um, can we maybe look at some uh, specific uh, examples or some specific uh, cases where uh, you think that uh, rules or, or, or principles are uh, more uh, relevant? And, 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 how, and, and, and how do we balance uh, rules and, and, and principles uh, 
uh, other than, as we know, uh, in, in, in reality, we all know that both IFRS and US GAAP are actually a mixture of rules and principles, and we can probably find some aspects of IFRS that are more rules-based than the equivalent part of US GAAP and vice versa. So uh, we shouldn't be uh, too uh, dogmatic about this, but can you think um, of some, some specific examples uh, or, 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 or ways to balance the, the two that you would like to mention? Um, you see, uh, my voice is the same. Um, no, thank you for allowing to, to, to come back to this point that I have already somehow alluded uh, to in my introduction to this uh, round table. Um, and I'm happy that all the discussion that is going on do, con do confirm the fact that we need both. Um, is there a concrete example where you know you would be better with a rule-based approach or a principle-based approach? I would go... Um, uh, um, try to have a kind of uh, overview on the topic and uh, saying that for me, when you are um, in territories that are not well defined and uh, where you don't really know uh, what you have to check, uh, you better have principle-based approach. That's for sure. It's uh, um, And then for a rule-based approach, uh, you need to go for simple thing. Uh, because if it's simple, then you can have quite rules uh, that it can be applied where you don't have too much issue of interpretation and so on. And if you look at the three points that uh, uh, accountant needs to go through, which is what, is what are you looking for? What is the data you're going to give? Uh, how do you present it? and who's going to look at it. And I think uh, the most simple point for this rule-based approach, of course, is the presentation. When it comes to the presentation, uh, and also it goes in line with this idea that uh, you need to have a good comparability. And the first thing for comparability goes through uh, the presentation. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You you have to look through the same page, through the same column. I'm not saying that you're gonna fill in a, a sec a form, but somehow uh, I think the EU should support this. But when we go for uh, the unknown territories, the ones that are coming for uh, non-financial reporting, definitely at this stage. Um, I think we will need to uh, uh, introduce some form of principle-based approach uh, because otherwise you will lose some data. I don't know if you will go fully <laughs> for uniformity, but you will not capture the full spectrum uh, you want to capture. And I think this is a, uh, maybe it's a dynamic approach. Huh? Maybe at some stage when the, the principle are well known and have been well developed in uh, uh, IFRS or other standards, you can move to rules. But uh, my cautious approach would be to start with principle. Thank you very much. Um, Araceli, to come back to you, do you want to add something on, on, on that point? Yes, I would like to say that when, when a principle is well articulated, um, minimum guidance is required just to make the standard operational and, and no more. And and the problem mainly is when the principles are not well articulated, which happens very often. In an ideal world, it's easier to have well articulated principles. But I have been living, when I was in tech for six years, uh, the listening standard and the IFRS uh, 15, revenue recognition. And I have to say that they are completely the opposite. Uh, listening standard is, a, in my view, this is my view, that's not research, is a very poor uh, articulated principle. So that's why we, we need so many rules and exceptions and so on. While IFRS 15 is a very good, very well articulated principle with a few exceptions. It, it was getting worse through the time, but from the beginning, it was <laughs> so good. So it was very difficult to think about a situation in which the principle doesn't drive you to more or less the correct answer. Uh, however, uh, we have to live in a world which is imperfect with lobbying interests and so on. So this mix, this balance between the two things is, is, is difficult. Thank you very much. Maybe the explanation for the 
problems with rules in the leasing standard is that, of course, we know the reason why that standard exists is that David Tweedy, so David Tweedy had a very <laughs> specific rule. He wanted the airplanes that he traveled on to appear on the balance sheet of the airplanes that, oh, that, that, that operated them. So that was the driving principle behind that, 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 that standard, and maybe that explains the, uh, the, the, the outcome. What I suggest now is that we turn to, to the audience. Uh, in case uh, there are any questions from, from the audience that you would like to put to the panel. Uh, I don't know if we have any roving microphones or... or, or oh, we have them. Okay, so we have them. We're, we're, we're more modern than that. Uh, we're fully digital. I don't know if this is structured or not, but uh, anyway, it's digital. So um, why uh, a European way to deal with financial accounts would be different from the American way? Is there any particular reason why maybe in America, hypothetically, let's say, they might go more for rules-based standards than we do in Europe? Who would like to take that? I can give you my opinion about that, but yeah. I, don't th I think you want to hear from the panel, not I from can, me. So, Klaus, please go ahead. Well, well the, the old story here, the, it is an institutional thing about mm -hmm. the, the legacy living uh, uh, environment and the legal environment here by, by the Americans' uh, interest in suing each other uh, for, for losing money. So yes, I think that is the simple explanation of, of the way that you draft accounting standards, to be very specific on that. That's why the US gap is so thick, so to say. You need air cover in order to protect yourself and make sure that you've done anything right. That's both from a preparer side and an auditor side. Um, the, the, another answer to that would be that if you look into the substance of how to account for transactions, if transactions are the same, there is no difference. There is no American way. But the, the way that you draft the standards is a different thing, but the transactions might be the same. So in that sense, there is no American way nor European way. Thank you. Do any other panelists want to add something on, the, on that point, or should we turn to the next question? No? Okay, let's, um, oh, we've got a new question at the top now. Question from Philippe Danjou. Um, so, um, the uh, enforcement principles of guidelines from dating back to CESAR, which uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, have been around for, for a, a long time, since, since 2005 apparently. Predates my time in accounting, so I, I wasn't aware that they date from that long ago. Um, but uh, would, would you think that uh, they, they need to be changed in any particular way? Um, Tina, I'm going to look at you because you're involved in that debate uh, within, within ESMA. Uh, of course, don't forget that Stephen is watching you, uh, so be careful what you say. Uh, but uh, please, go ahead. Well, uh, the enforcement gu guidance is updated right now, uh, mm -hmm. this year, so, so there will be some changes in it. But, uh, uh, and I think uh, um, it is most bec because uh, enforcers should work in the same way. Um, uh, not have different uh, enforcement in different countries. So I think uh, the guidelines tighten a bit uh, how we do things. And I think that could be useful. Thank you. Hans? We focus more and more within uh, financial analysis also on non-financial data, on uh, non-financial reporting, on integrated reporting. I'm afraid that will be force the enforcer to change a certain number of the rules he's applying right now because of those changing circumstances. Indeed, uh, and I, I think the, the reference to non-financial standards, uh, non-financial information standards, which a number of people have made, are, are, are a very relevant one in this context because uh, this is clearly the way of the future, I think, and the whole debate about rules versus principles is going to be reproduced in that context. Some people will say, the only way to get comparability is to have rules, a uniform set of indicators. Uh, but of course, you can question whether that is really relevant when you have companies with very different business models, very different economic activities. So I foresee that this debate will continue for a number of years as we move into the next wave of standardization, which is the, 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 the non-financial information standards. Yeah. So um, there's a, an, an anonymous question about uh, IFRS which is currently applied in 140, more than 140 jurisdictions with a proliferation of carve-ins and outs. I'm glad to say in Europe we don't do carve-ins, uh, and we've only done two carve-outs. 
uh, with a few paragraphs in the hundreds of pages. So we're not responsible for this. Um, but uh, do you think a rules-based uh, IFRS uh, or, or a more rules-based IFRS would uh, maybe result in more uh, tailor or, or custom-made standards in, 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 in different sure. jurisdictions? Sure. Araceli. Yeah, sure. Rules on rules and exceptions on rules and it doesn't work. But this is exactly the, 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 the point to which I refer uh, to the experience we had with the Growth and Stability Pact. Mm -hmm. We had rules, I don't know if they were stupid or not, but in the end, they were not, it was too, they could not fit to the reality you had to, uh, to take the picture of. So you added new rules and you made it more complex. And then you came to this issue, uh, that is the question of the cost benefits analysis. And you don't want to get to this point where users believe that uh, to apply these standards make it uh, too costly uh, regarding the benefits they get out of it. So you better not go to 100% rule-based approach because uh, even though the EU uh, doesn't want to go to the uh, Carvin, I've seen that in the fitness check, I'm happy about this. Uh, no, I'm surprised to read this because, uh, frankly, uh, 2005, I was already there in the parliament discussing this topic, uh, fighting with people who didn't want to settle the César. But um, uh, everybody was afraid, complaining, and blah, blah, blah. And now everybody looks very conservative, huh? uh, which is maybe a good news. It means that being, people have been learning by doing. Uh, but on this way, I think uh, a fully rule-based approach is a dangerous one. Not, not the least, because it would mean you go to a more complex system, which is less enforceable and more costly. Thank you. Hans, I think one thing you. which you mentioned is, of, of, honestly speak, I think the fact that we work principle-based is the key to success and the reason why it is being applied in 140 countries. Because why do users prefer the, the, the prospective guidance and not only the rule-based. Uh, we, we want a faithful presentation of economic reality, not only of the figures. Uh, responsiveness to our needs as users for clarity and transparency. How can we look at that? Consistency with a clear conceptual framework. Remark has come a number of times already. Based on appropriately defined scope that addresses a broad area of accounting and reporting, and it has to be clear concise and in plain language. If it's too rule-based, we're not going to get them. A lot of people think that because it's principle-based, it's complex. I agree. It's because it's rule-based, it's complex, not because it's principle-based. And you need to have to be able to use a reasonable judgment. I think that is what investors and users are looking for. So this is the reason. For this, you need good governance. That is true. And, yeah, maybe Carsten, maybe you want just that to add to what Hans said, I, I agree with uh, your observations on that one. I think you know, this has been one of the key uh, success factors, I think, for implementation of IFRS on a global basis. And the reason, I think, part of the reason at least, is that you know, it's, it's, uh, IFRS are designed for um, you know, many different legal um, environments, many different jurisdictions. So if you come up with a rule, there's always a risk that you know, some territory will say, well, uh, things really work differently here in my particular jurisdiction, so that's part of the reason. Um, I think it's also important to note that even though IFRS may be, you know, principle-based standards, that doesn't mean they don't have any rules, right? I think there are quite a few rules in IFRS, um, but still the standards are principle-based, so that, and there are good, uh, good reasons for those rules. Uh, you know, it, it could be something like, you know, defining the scope of a standard, that's pretty much rules-driven. It could be um, other things such as, I don't know, for example, the initial recognition exemption in IS-12. There are good reasons for, for these rules, but uh, there are rules already in there um, in, in a principle-based standards. Well, and so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having um, a limited, uh, let's say, a limited amount of, of rules. Of, of course, if you, if you put in too many of these rules, things get difficult, right? Because then uh, that's where all the complexities come up with if you end up with uh, exceptions and so on. That's where also some of the interpretation questions come up. So you should avoid that, but sometimes in limited circumstances, it's also necessary and a good thing, I think. 
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've gone through the questions that we had from the audience. So as a wrap up, um, there are six of you uh, and uh, not that much time left. Uh, so what I suggest is that we go from Pervenche uh, in the other direction to see if what would be your closing words about uh, this whole debate we've been having, not necessarily just about financial reporting. Do you also want to maybe say something about the, the, what is that? as I said, I think the next wave, non-financial reporting, but what, what lessons could we draw more generally from, from this debate? Yeah. Uh, thank you for having it, and uh, no doubt, uh, get ready for the next discussion, which is going to be about uh, non-financial reporting, uh, which uh, set a scene that is quite different, with uh, new challenges, but we, where we really have to draw the lesson exactly from this debate, which means if you want to have uh, a standard that are enforceable. Uh, it cannot be 100% rule-based, uh, and that uh, where you can have more uh, a rule-based approach would be in the presentation, because I think this does help, also in the scope where the, where the, the standard are applied. Uh, but please keep this in the principle to make sure you have the broadest scene possible uh, uh, covered, and the diversity of the a model included in your picture, which is what you want. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Pastor. I, I would, my closing remark would be that um, we have something fantastic, and that is a written framework, a uh, conceptual framework for IFRS. I think that's the key here is to uh, respect the framework, all from standard setter side and also from enforcer side and also from a preparer side. Because this is a truly great, great thing to have. Here you say that reports should give a true and fair view of the, of the business. You have criteria like relevance and faithful for representation that we should guide what the standard setter does. You have a materiality concept to adding to that and you have comparability as an enhancing phenomena. I think this is a great thing. And so, Going back to that, and remember, those are the starting points for drafting standards, and then you have further guidance also in the framework when going down for recognition, management, and presentation. But this is a truly great thing. And if you have this thinking, binding it together, then you have a global standard. And that's one of the key features here. Thank you. You have your mic, so the you're microphone. Okay. Yeah. 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 I would say that in the case of uh, ISBI for us, uh, which are global standards, they should keep in a principle based, obviously mm, just not perfect, but some guide it depending on the on the standards. But if one of this system work, the responsibility of the problems is not of the standard setters, it's of the other stakeholders. So we cannot blame and put the responsibility on the standard setters to solve problems that they cannot and they don't have to solve. It's not their problem. Okay, thank you. I, I think that's probably going to make Daryl a lot more relaxed about going into the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tina. I believe that a, a principle-based accounting standards uh, could be enforceable as long as it is enough uh, uh, sufficient guidance. Uh, and the guidance uh, should be within the standard, uh, even if uh, also others' guidance will, will be useful. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hans? Rule-based or principle-based are both enforceable, I believe. I, we prefer as analysts here in Europe the principle-based. Of course, probably my colleagues in the US will apparently prefer the, uh, let's say, rule-based. Uh, we need comparability. Uh, but we need also freedom, freedom of interpretation, which is important. And we need a number of rules, but not too many rules. If we see how rapidly things are changing now, we have to be careful not to be overruled in both sentence, senses of the word is a concern that we do have. And of course, we should prepare for non-financial reporting. Okay, thank you. Carsten? I'd probably say, you know, li life would be so much easier if we had a rules-based regime. Uh, I think it would be much easier for enforcers would also be much easier for companies, would be much easier for auditors. You can just tick the box. So um, I, I do think life would be much easier, but I think the, um, the important point is, you know, what's the overall objective of financial reporting? And I think that objective is, you know, to provide high quality financial statements uh, and information to, to, the, to, to the users um, and other stakeholders of financial statements. 
Um, and given that objective, I, I, I think we can, cannot make our, our lives th that easy, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Can I please ask you to give a big round of applause to the panelists and... And in particular, congratulations to Pervenche for having her voice yes. uh, still at the indeed, end of the panel. Indeed. <laughs>